Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I love it that the bishop comes and you all get in your seats. Peter, it, it usually doesn't work for me that way, too. Uh, so, so. So, just a, a word as we begin. And let's start with a word of prayer here. So, uh, why don't we all just put our feet on the ground here and uh, bring ourselves to this space where the Lord is nowhere if the Lord is not here. Divine and invisible presence, power of our lives, we ask that you help us to be particularly present to you on this gifted day for us, and we ask that you might manifest yourself in the body that we are, and that as we come together to stump the bishop, you might stir our spirits. And we give thanks for you, we give thanks for him, we give thanks for all of us, and we give thanks on this day for the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, the way we participate in your mission. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Jill, so the four people coming in now have to sit in the front, so there's also some chairs in the back. Uh, Plenty of room down front. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and it's, not, it's not fair because it's the confirmation it's of those being right, received. Right, right, right. So we're in the other room together, but that's okay. Come on down. They would have gotten here earlier and sat right. back if they could have been. Well, I could just take all these chairs and then put them in the back. Right, right. Uh, I just want to say one other thing. Is, uh, the bishop, you're going to get a chance to stump the bishop here in a moment, but uh, I just want to give you a window into something really beautiful as we walk through uh, on the way in. Uh, uh, Peter Prevail is, is working on his, ma his Haitian magic over the stove, and I got a chance to listen to the bishop who uh, lived in Haiti for, I think, three years or something like that in another, another chapter of your life. Speak patient with Peter. Very, very good. Okay, so Thank this you. is your show, and you're right. on. And we're glad and to And I be think here. we yeah. have until quarter up, right? Yes. So, okay. Hi, I'm Ian. I'm your bishop diocesan, and it is a, a real incredible blessing um, and honor to be your bishop. So I'm delighted to to be here for confirmations and receptions this morning. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay, great. And I asked Peter, "What do you, you know, in your adult ed, what do you want to do? Do you want me to do anything?" He said, "Well." What can you do? I said, I'll do whatever you want me to do. <laughs> Whether it was topical or, you know, consistent with what you've been doing here in your adult ed or, or take questions or have open conversation. Or, and then I naively said, or play stump the bishop. And he said, oh, that sounds good, so let's do that. <laughs> so how do I, how does this work generally? What I like to do is take questions right up front or topics or issues that you might want to discuss, and I'll list them on the board. I'll think or maybe pray for a second and see if there's any rhyme or reason, and try to perhaps do like a 20-minute didactic, a 20-minute, here's how it might make sense, these topics. Say something about that, share some ideas, and then have any follow-up, what did we miss? Do you still have questions, okay? Does that sound like a good way of doing it? So what do you, what do you want to talk about? What questions, yeah, yeah. Who are you? Who, who am I? Your background. Okay, background. That's, that's way too easy. <laughs> that's mine, that would be, I'll put my initials, how about that? Great. Yes, please. What are the most challenging issues that you face? Ah, okay. Cool, great. Yes? I'm interested in prayer book revision. Prayer book revision? Yeah. Excellent. And uh, or, or <laughs> I, I will nuance that a little bit and call it liturgical revision because, I'm getting into the answer, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Is I have more liturgical to, revision okay? I have more to my question. Uh -huh. um, I'm particularly interested in the baptismal liturgy and the marriage liturgy. Okay. And I'm also interested in the fact that the Episcopal Church has deep resources for liturgy. Yes. Existing already. Yep. And could we incorporate some of them? Yes, okay, that's great. Okay, so, litur okay if I call it liturgical revision? Mm -hmm. Which is greater than simply uh, prayer book revision. Okay. Great. 
Great. I have a question about Luke 21, 25 through 36. It said, Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Right. Yeah. You explain so, <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you coming to church after this? Oh, well, then you won't hear my sermon on it, right? That, that's what I was wondering. So, so I, I will be preaching about that. So, okay, we could talk about end times. Oh. Good one, Lance. <laughs> you know, what, what's God up to in that arc of history? From the beginning of time to the end of time, that's good. Yeah, come on. You get two, huh? Because it's an easy one first, right? Yeah. What's your vision for our diocese five, ten years out? Okay. Where do you want to take us? Yeah. I got one. Okay. Yes. Can you explain Revelation to us, please? <laughs> I actually have some hints around that. It's not, it's not unrelated to this, right? Yeah, some of us here want to know about that. <laughs> and not unrelated to that, actually. Yes, in the back. Uh, social relevance and eternal significance. Of what? Of the church. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Uh, the church has a huge social relevance and eternal significance of the church. What would be? Sounds like important. How do we become or remain eternally important and significant when many of us are trying to be more and more social development? Great. Okay. Yep. Yep. You know, this is good. This is good. Yeah. Maybe one or two more. Sure. I, I know you visit parishes all over Connecticut. Yep. What are some of the common threads of the vibrant um, churches? Yeah. And I'm going to put. Sure. I think I can do it. One more? One more? Yes, please, Jewel. This is not relevant to any of those, but um, 39 articles. Yes. What am I supposed to do with those? <laughs> 39 articles. <laughs> 39 articles. What am I supposed to do with them? 39 articles. Okay, that's probably enough, right? <laughs> um, Let me just pause for a second and see if I can figure this out. <laughs> yeah, okay. How about this? Um, I'll begin with a little bit, just my, a little bit, very brief story. So thank you. And besides, it's good feminist pedagogy to begin with one's own experience. So that's good. Um, and then I think, in all honesty, I think this is the big question about who are we as Christians and what is our vocation as the body of Christ. And that is not unrelated to the big picture, the end times. So if, I, if we begin here, just who am I, but then really the large picture, right? What's God up to in the world and how do we understand our role and place in that. And that can become very specific as to, yeah, and so what does that mean about for the Episcopal Church in Connecticut? Um, and what are some of the challenging issues, challenging issues exactly right before us, which includes liturgical revision, and the 39 articles have something to say about that. How's that? Okay. That makes sense? Um, so, uh, my name's Ian. I grew up in the Episcopal Church in central Massachusetts. I'm a product of really working class folk. They came to the um, 
United States in the early 20th century to work in the mills in central Massachusetts. Uh, my father's family came from England and Scotland, and my uh, mother's side were French Canadian. So the choice was, was I going to be Anglican or was I going to be um, French Canadian Roman Catholic? So I really identify myself in many ways as an ethnic Anglican. So I, I'm an Episcopalian because of my ethnicity. In Fitchburg, Massachusetts, where I grew up, the question was, when growing up, what are you? Meaning, you know, where, where did your parents and grandparents come from? And what religion are you? And that was, you know, were you, were you Catholic or Protestant and what flavor? Of course, we also had Jews and Muslims, but we didn't count that. So I grew up in the church. Um, I was blessed to be part of that church of the mid 20th century, which, you know, 300 kids in church school, everyone went to church. Uh, that is very much a product of what can sometimes be described as Christendom. And yet in the 20th century, in late 20th century and into the 21st century, um, like many of us, I had to find my way and own my faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, as the questions that will be put before the confirmands and those being received today and really have been blessed to be part of this church and really work in the wider Anglican communion for most of my life in ministry. I came to this particular position from being a, a faculty person at a seminary for 22 years in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I was very blessed to be part of the, really the emergence of the Anglican communion in all of the challenges and possibilities of this time and place. I'm married. Uh, for 36 years to Kristen, who is a midwife and works primarily with ethnic and immigrant communities in New Haven. And um, we have three children, three adult children, uh, two boys and or two men and, and a woman. And they are, they're grown now. They're in their, their late 20s and early 30s. And they live from Washington, D.C. up through New York and, and Connecticut. So we're really blessed. So. And I've been your bishop for nine years. This is my ninth year, so it's really great. It's the best job ever, so I love it. So thank you. Uh, social relevance and eternal significance. Uh, let's start there, because that's really the question. The question is, who are we as followers of Jesus, as disciples? And what is our vocation? And that, and that has eternal significance. We join in ourselves to the, to the loving God, the creator God, in and through what God has done in Jesus, fully human and fully divine. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, the spirit in our lives, we are connected to God and one another. And that matters to God. It matters to us. And it matters to to how we live our life in the world. That has social relevance. We are disciples, followers of Jesus. We are drawn towards that incarnate God. But we are equally compelled, so there is a, a centripetal pulling in and connection to God and one another in Christ, in that cosmic Christ, the reality of God in the world. But we are equally sent out as apostles because we are each and every one of us by virtue of our baptism, disciples, followers of Jesus, but we're also apostles. Do you ever think of yourself as apostles? Sent to participate in the mission of God in the world. And so being disciples and apostles by virtue of our baptism matters. It matters to God. It matters to ourselves individually, and it matters to the world and those to, with whom we are connected. So really, understanding this significance in light of a grand narrative, a story that begins with creation and goes to the end of time, is really fundamentally important. And here, only because I can't help myself, 
we understand that story where we are disciples of Jesus, connected and sent into the world as apostles, we under that, understand that story in light of the mission of God. The mission of God. What is God up to? What is God up to in the world? And how do we understand it? What is the story that we attach ourselves to? And what is the story of which we are stewards and sent into the world? The great educator and theologian, Werner Dozier. Anyone know Werner Dozier? One of the greatest Christian ed teachers in the history of the church. Werner Dozier once said to me, Ian, if you don't know the story of God and can't say what the Bible is up to, Holy Scripture, in 10 minutes, then you don't know Scripture. And I went, whoa, okay. Can you do the whole Bible in 10 minutes? Because if you can't, then what's the story we're attached to? And she would argue, and she did, in the kind of great African-American oral tradition, that being able to tell that story of God from the beginning of time to the end of time, and our place in it is fundamental to who we are as followers of Jesus, participating in the mission of God in the world. So, what, let's just try it out. What is this story that we attach ourselves to? What is the mission of God? God in creation, because of God's love, brought all things into being. And through actually a process of making different light from dark, the heavens from the earth, dry land from the waters, birds of the air and of the sea from animals of dry land, and then humanity, male and female. There is a God in God's love created things differently. And what was the refrain every time God brought differentiation into being? It was good. And it was good. Difference as good and as fundamental as part of God. It's a, there's a wholeness there, right? There's a kind of a fecundity, a possibility in all of our differences. That's the narrative of creation. But no sooner had that wholeness and difference been created than what happens? What happens? Separation. It breaks apart, right? It breaks apart. That brokenness, what do we call that brokenness? Sin. Perfect. The prayer book definition is pretty good in our catechism. It says, sin is the seeking of our own will instead of the will of God. Remember this? Thus distorting our relationships with God, with other people, and with creation. It's a pretty good definition, right? Brokenness, distorted relationship with God, with each other, and with all creation. That brokenness, God does not want to leave us in that place. So God says, I'm going to make this whole again. My vocation, my reason for being in, in the world, the mission of God is to restore that wholeness. To restore all people to unity with God and with each other. Okay? How does God do that? You're getting ahead of the story. There's a whole lot of that narrative before we ever get to Jesus. God says, I will enter into covenants, promises, relatedness. First, you know, we'll start again. We'll, we'll wash the earth clean and we'll start again and I'll put a rainbow in the sky as a commitment of my relatedness to you. That's one covenant. Another covenant. Your people will be my people. The sands of the earth will be as numerous as your people. Abraham, I mean, um, so Abraham and, and Sarah, right? So that, that wholeness... The, the vocation of the people of Israel to be a light to the nations. 
so that all people can learn to be in right ordered relationship with God. And how do they do? Come see, come saw, right? Yes and no. So God says, okay, I will, I will assist you by giving you a road map of right relationship. What's that called? The commandments, the Torah, the law, right? So we have our path back to the wholeness with God and with one another. How do they do? Not so great. So God says, I know, I will empower people to remind folk how to be in right relationship through the law so that those covenants can be lived into. Who do we call those folk? Prophets. Prophets. There, we've just done Hebrew Bible. Okay? Right, and James, right. Okay? And then, as Christians, we say, yes, so, you know, the eternal covenants with God and with one another, the, the law, prophets reminding us how to be in right relationship, all have efficacy. And as Christians, we say, and God did another unique thing to help heal that brokenness in the world. What did God do? God said, I will, I will take on that gulf, that brokenness. I will, I will enter into humanity to make all things new, a new creation. And God did that by becoming human in Jesus. Right? That's what the incarnation is all about. That repair. This, this is fully human and fully God coming back together. And how did the world do with that? Not good. Could, could we countenance that wholeness of God? No. So we tried to nail it to a tree. And what did God say? It's not the end of the story. Because this wholeness, this restoring all people to unity with God and each other in Christ, oh, by the way, that's the catechism's definition of the mission of the church. Actually, it's the mission of God in which the church is blessed to participate is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ, is the vocation of what God is doing in making things whole and new in Jesus. And this is the amazing thing. God does not leave it there. But God said, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I need you in all of the differences and languages and ways by which we have been created in Pentecost, I need you to be part of this vocation of the repair of the world. Okay? And so that at Pentecost, we are blessed by the Holy Spirit and empowered to be part of the mission of God in the world. And how do we do? It's the same old story. Sin hasn't disappeared, right? I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. You can't be part of this because you don't eat the right food. You're not circumcised. So all of the epistles and all of the pastoral letters are about how are we called to be the body of Christ so that we can be about God's mission in the world. And then at the end of the story, in these end times, because it, it, there is an arc to this story. The vision for Revelation. I can't pretend to understand what Revelation is all about. But the vision for Revelation is that all creation, in all of the differences, all of those seraphs and you know, multi-winged and people, are gathered around the Lamb of God, are gathered around the throne of God in that promise that in the end of time, this will be back together. Okay? So that's the arc of, of our narrative. And we are baptized into that vocation of being agents of God's restoring, reconciling action in the world. And we are sent to be about that work in the world. So if you, if you get the mission of God and that grand narrative, I'm not so much of a postmodernist that I don't believe in a narrative, I do believe in a grand narrative, then we can begin to see 
what the end times will look like. We trust and believe that the goodness of creation in all of our differences will be affected, and in fact has already begun to be affected in the wholeness of Jesus. Does that make sense? So if you look at that, the vision, okay, the vision for the next five, ten years for the Episcopal Church in Connecticut is for each and every one of us to own our place and participate in the mission of God. Full stop. Each and every one of us, as individuals and as the collected body in our local parish communities, and, and here's the really radical part, and as the church as a whole, because in Congregational Connecticut it's way too easy to, to be completely insular in your own parish. But each and every one of us, particularly in our individual selves, in our individual parishes, but as a whole, as the body of Christ, in this case 165 parishes, 50,000 people across Connecticut in six regions, participating and finding our place in the mission of God. How, how do you do it? Do you see yourself as part of that grand narrative? Everything that we do in our parishes and in our lives as the body of Christ known as the Episcopal Church in Connecticut is to extend and participate in that mission of God that we just described. Now, in the 20th century, in Christendom as it was known, it was about the church. Keeping the church going was the goal. It'd be nice sometimes when we talk about what God's doing in Jesus. But that, because we enjoyed being blessed by the power, privilege, and place of Christendom, Christendom being that close relationship between the church and the social, political, and economic powers of the time, we didn't always have to talk about God and God's mission, as long as the church kept on going. Well, I'm here to say that Christendom is kind of on its last legs. I mean, think about it. In so much, particularly in New England, people don't think about going to church anymore. We've gone from the center to the margin, from places of privilege to the periphery. Historically, New England used to be the most religious part of the United States. If you don't believe me, how many churches are between here and downtown, right? And that's true in all of our villages. For the, as long as I've been your bishop, the Pew and Gallup Poll every year runs um, their studies about the most and least religious parts of the United States. All six states in New England are in the top 10 least religious states in the United States. And the four top places are held by New England states. Connecticut generally is around someplace between six and eight. So we used to be the most religious, now we're the least religious. We've gone from the center to the, to the margin. And so, as I like to say, and, or sometimes write about, we're, we're leaving that world where the church had been blessed by the social, political, and economic forces that are, and entering a new missional age. We need to be very clear about this story in our lives so that we can be about God's work in the world. That's so a vision for the next five or ten years, and the common threads, frankly, that, that run across all of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut is in this new missional age, how are we individually and together being the agents of God's restoring, reconciling love that God has blessed us to be and calls us to be as disciples, followers of Jesus, and as apostles sent into the world. So the challenging issues before the church are, how are we to be the body of Christ in this new missional age? It's, it's a grand and glorious time for us as Christians because all bets are off. All bets are off. I sometimes say that 
You know, we're living in the, and I know it was Chris Christopherson who wrote it, but we're living in the, in the Janis Joplin's time of change. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. We, as the body of Christ, actually can do and be whatever God needs us to be. I sometimes say, and I say it almost every Sunday, and I'll say it here because it's a good opportunity. Here's a faith statement. God has had and will always have that body of Christ. We call that the church since the incarnation and Pentecost. God has had and will always have that body of Christ that God needs to be about God's purposes, the mission of God. God has had and will always have the church that God needs to be about God's mission. So the big challenge for us is, will we have anything to do with that? Will we in the Episcopal Church, and I'm talking very particularly about the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, have anything to do with that church that God needs to be about God's mission? And if we're not asking that question, then we're not asking the right question. And so, even in how we come together, or particularly as Anglicans, as Episcopalians, where worship is so central, and the prayers that we say are so central to how we are to be that body of Christ that God needs to be about God's mission. We have a, I see Justin back there, we, we have a, a, a great theological tradition known as lex orendi, lex credendi. How am I doing, Justin? Okay. The, the, words, the words that we pray or say are the words that we believe, and the words that we believe are the words that we say. So we actually pray ourselves into being faithful to the mission of God. This gets to the question of liturgical revision. And the reason why I say liturgical revision is because you can imagine for Anglicans and any of you who are around when, quote, the new prayer book was brought into being, right, 1979, the new prayer book, how much upset there was in the church because the 1928 prayer book was no longer the order of the day. Now there is, believe it or not, we're coming up on, what, 50 years since the new prayer book, and a lot has changed, right? Uh, whether it's the end of Christendom or this new appreciation for who we are as disciples and apostles in the mission of God in this new missional age. So we need to be asking ourselves, the words we, are the words that we pray the words that we believe and the words that we believe the words that we pray? And, particularly when everything seems to be ebbing away, people say, don't touch the 1979 Book of Common Prayer. Well, there was, at our general convention which was held last summer, where we make our common decisions in a bicameral legislative manner, there was a, a huge omnibus resolution, the effect of which was the Book of Common Prayer, 1979, remains the Book of Common Prayer. So that's, will be, that's why we're not talking about prayer book revision. And we are free, the other part of the resolution, we are free to experiment in wonderful and crazy ways. So the, we, the doors are open for liturgical revision while the prayer book remains. It's a kind of classic Anglican way of doing things, right? <laughs> Nothing changes and everything changes. <laughs> right? No, I'm, I'm very serious. And frankly, that's the way the Church of England has been doing their liturgical revision since 1662, because the 1662 prayer book is still the prayer book, the official prayer book of the Church of England, and it hasn't been seen in lots of pews for generations, okay? So we are entering the same process of liturgical revision, and there's an invitation now to be more experimental as long as it's connected and under the... the of course, the bishops wrote the resolution under the, the, the watchful eye of a liturgical commission in a diocese as appointed by the bishops. Okay? How am I doing? Almost done? 
five, six, one, oh, 39 articles. So what, what are the 39 articles? Anyone know? No, that was Luther. Ooh. And those are, uh, what, how many theses, Justin? 500? So, right. 99. 99. Oh, thank, I'll, th I'll ask the Luther, the former, the, the soon to be former Lutherans. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, the 39 articles were sometimes part of, understood of how do we define the church in, during the Elizabethan settlement? How can we be genuinely the church, not us, the church? of England, of the people of England, and still be connected to the church that's gone before. It was a way of hammering out that relationship, which is right at the heart of being Anglican. So, Jewel, you asked the question. Right at the heart of being Anglican, the 39 articles articulate how we are to be Anglican, genuinely of the location in England, yet connected to the church that's gone before. So I sometimes say local and global, particular and universal, contextual and Catholic. That way of being Anglican, that both and way of being Anglican. And the 39 articles were the description of how that was to be in effectively the English Reformation. How are we to be genuinely English and connected to the church that's gone before? We call and afterwards we call that the Church Universal, the Church Catholic. We in the Episcopal Church do not subscribe to the Thirty Nine Articles as ordained people. We do not sign on that on the dotted line. In the Church of England, they do. So, they are listed in the back of the prayer book as historical documents, important to describe how Anglicans, by process, live in that both and space. Did I do it? Did I cover it? Does that make sense? I think we have to go to church, right, Please Peter? One more question. Okay. Right. What's that? Does anybody have one more, one more question? question? Right. Yeah. It would seem to me that a focus on communicating social relevance to young people and young families is yep. critical to ensure the long term viability of the church. Is there a. Uh, uh, I, I would say not only for young people, <laughs> but for all of us. No, I'm, I'm very serious. I mean, if, if we know our story and can articulate and find our place in that narrative, in that mission of God, which is, I believe, fundamentally life-giving and freeing. And I, it doesn't matter if you're three years old or four years old. That's what godly play is all about. Rightly understood, adolescent ca confirmation classes are about finding that place. Definitely young people. I mean, the, it's not the church as an institution. <clears throat> At least my kids and you know, the 20-somethings and 30-somethings want to be about. They want to be about that, that narrative. They want meaning. And if we can't be about this meaning, then you know, they'll happily pass us by as an institution. But it also counts at the end of our lives. I mean, when we're taking stock of how we lived our lives as followers of Jesus. You know, both w where was it that we can thank God for the blessings that we've been involved in this work? And where was it that we confess where we've, you know, followed Apollos or said no, that, that you know, you're, you're not, circumci you're not um, circumcised so you can't be in. When, when have we been agents of, separation and division. So I, I think, frankly, yes, absolutely, for young adults, the more we can be articulate about what it, the relationship with God and Jesus and what that means to change lives and change the world, that will commend this thing that we describe as the church. But if we say come to church because it's a good institution, not a lot of, not a lot of energy there. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so you just all went to the Episcopal Divinity School. Right. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure.